All right, welcome to the last session of today. Um, we have three talks in the session. The first one will be given by Anna Papa from University College London. It's a comprehensive analysis of quantum e-voting protocols. Uh, thanks a lot. So this is a joint work with Mirto Arapinis and Nicolas Labru from the University of Edinburgh and Elham Kasefri from uh, UPMC. So, um, in general, why are we interested in uh, electronic voting? Uh, compared to manual procedures, electronic voting could provide for higher voter participation, better accuracy, enhanced security guarantees, and possible verification of counting against untrusted authorities, which is something that we actually can't do um, in uh, uh, manual procedures in election centers. So, in general, all electronic voting protocols, like most cryptographic protocols in general, are based on computational assumptions like integer factorization and discrete logarithm. And there have been efforts to use uh, quantum information in order to uh, provide better security for um, quantum electronic uh, procedures. For example, in uh, Geneva, in uh, uh, Switzerland in 2007, if I remember correctly, they used QKD in order to uh, provide security for the transmission of um, the uh, election uh, results from the uh, centers uh, to the uh, central authority. However, we could ask if we could uh, provide new quantum uh, uh, schemes in order to use quantum mechanics to achieve better guarantees. So uh, could we do something like that and attain the same properties that classical electronic voting uh, schemes provide? So what are these properties that we would, we would uh, ideally ask for an electronic voting protocol? That would be eligibility. So uh, we want eligible voters to be able to vote. We want to uh, secure the privacy of the votes. We also want to prevent double voting, so the voters are not allowed to, to vote two times. Then we would ideally want verifiability to be able to check that the, um, the count is done correctly. And at the end, we would also like to have receipt freeness. So receipt freeness is the thing that uh, doesn't allow you to sell your vote to someone else. So this is what the, um, the booths in the election centers uh, 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 provide, so that someone cannot get into the, uh, the booth and see what you have voted for, so that you can sell your vote. Okay, so what we have tried to do in this, in this, uh, this review is to uh, categorize the existing uh, proposals for uh, quantum electronic voting. We've done this in, in four groups. So the first one is what we call protocols based on two measurement bases. So here the ballot is an entangled state. It has a property that when measured in the computational basis, the sum of the outcomes is equal to zero. And when measured in the Fourier basis, all the outcomes are equal. And a state that provides this is the D1 state. There have been two, um, uh, two papers that uh, use this type of, um, of uh, protocol, both in uh, PRA, the one in 2014, and the second one in 2016. And the protocols go as follows. So we have a lot of states that are shared. They are tested by uh, the voters with using a cut and choose technique. Most of them are, are checked and measured, then some of them um, remain uh, and to be used for the, uh, for the protocol. Then the remaining ones are measured on the computational basis to create an almost random matrix, almost random because uh, the states that I showed before, the D1 states are used. So it's, uh, they have this property that when they measure the computational basis, the sum of the outcomes is equal to zero. So we have a classical matrix n times n, n is the number of the voters. Then the voters add their vote to specific place in the matrix according to the result of measuring a second um, quantum state, D2. So what this D2 does is it gives a permutation of the indices of the voters. So the voters, what they have when they measure all the, the states is they have a random uh, a matrix D, uh, N times N. Each voter has, is responsible for one column. So V1, for example, is, cost, is uh, responsible for the first column v2 for the second column, et cetera, and then measuring this state gives them a permutation. It tells them in which row they're gonna put their, um, uh, their vote. So at the end, each vote is equal to the sum of the elements of one row in the matrix. So since they're broadcasting their uh, votes, then they can actually, you can actually, everyone can, can check that uh, their vote is included in the, in the outcome. Okay, so everything is working. Um, quite nicely. However, there's a small problem with this cut and choose technique uh, because 
if we have an untrusted party that shares this, uh, this D1 states that I showed you before, each voter is checking a lot of these states uh, by asking the voters to check uh, both in computation and Hadamard. However, we can show that if it's an adversary that shares these states and controls any fraction of the voters, then with non-negligible probability in delta, which is a security parameter, we can have n corrupted states pass the, uh, pass the test. So there's a, there's a problem with this cut and choose technique in, uh, in, in, this, uh, proposed, uh, in this proposed protocols. Okay, now the second um, category of protocols is what we call traveling ballot protocols. Now here what is happening is there's a ballot that goes around all voters. So Italia prepares two entangled qubits, sends one to travel from voter to voter, so keeps one and the other is traveling around. Then all the voters in sequence apply an operation to this ballot qubit that goes around. So if they want to vote in a referendum election, for example, they want to vote for yes, then they apply an operation. If they, don't, if they want to vote for no, they don't apply anything. So this ballot qubit goes around and then back to the Talia, and then the Talia does a measurement on the whole state and computes the result. Okay, there's been a number of, um, of uh, uh, papers on this type of uh, protocol starting from 2006 and um, uh, the last one in 2011, unless we're uh, missing something. Um, so this is a schematic diagram of how the traveling ballot protocol uh, works. Uh, one QDIT uh, goes from the Italia to the voter and goes around to the last voter and then back to the Italia. So they have, there are a few problems with this, with this type of protocols. First of all, there is no verifiability. Uh, there's also a problem with double voting, and this has been acknowledged by, by the authors of the, of the work, of the previous works, um, these works as well. But we have also identified a problem with privacy. So if there is an honest voter in the, in, in the middle of two dishonest ones, so VK is honest and the one before and after are dishonest, then by doing specific measurements, they can actually find out the, um, uh, the, the, the vote of, um, of the honest voter in the middle. So, except from the already identified uh, problems, there's also a privacy problem. Now, concerning uh, the double voting problem that has been identified by the office as well, there have been some proposals that use a different type of, of scheme for, for voting. So these are called distributed ballot protocols. So in this case, the Talia doesn't send a QDIT around the voters. What it, what, uh, it does is it sends uh, a part of an entangled state to uh, all the voters, one QDIT to each, uh, to each voter, and it also sends an option QDIT. So it sends uh, a QDIT for a yes vote and a QDIT for a, for a no vote. And what each voter needs to do here they need to append this option credit to the ballot code that they received, do some specific measurements, do some correction operation, and then send it back to the, um, to the Talia. And then the, at the end, the Talia has a big entangled state that includes um, in the exponent, as you see, theta y and theta n, which is a specific um, uh, way that the option codes have been um, have been formed, and it also includes this M in the exponent, which is the number of yes votes. So by doing an appropriate measurement, the Talia has all the information in order to, um, to get back the outcome M of the referendum. And it is true that trying to find, trying to cheat this, trying to find this, uh, uh, this um, uh, parameters that, uh, with which the option queues have been formed, this theta y and theta n, can be detected if you run the protocol many times. So you just need to check that the outcome is the same all the time, and any, um, any effort to tamper with, his, um, um, uh, with, the, with the option codes can be detected. And this is true. This is what the, um, the authors of, uh, of the protocols of these papers um, have, um, have shown. But what we have uh, found by uh, checking a bit more in detail the protocol is that you don't really need to find out the exact properties, uh, the exact parameters of the option codes. What we need to find is something uh, different. You need to find the difference between these two parameters because of the way that, um, that these parameters are defined. You, you, you don't need to really, really know uh, what is uh, exactly how the option credits are made. So T at the end, the Talier at the end, when he uh, gets back all the credits, the, the state that he has has that form, after he does um, his specific correction, the form that he has has a, a, at the exponent this Ly minus Ln. So this difference 
comes from the theta uh, y minus theta n, and it's, it's something that's, that is, is, is kind of different from learning the exact values. So there's two observations that we can do. If this difference is known, then a malicious voter can transfer any number of votes from un one option to the other, so he can in practice double vote. And observation two is that we can actually find this difference with overwhelming probability in the number of, of voters. So what we have done is we have basically found an algorithm for an adversary to run if he controls any number or any fraction of, um, of the voters um, in order to retrieve this difference. And what he needs to do is he basically needs to instruct the, uh, the voters that he controls to uh, vote half yes and half no, then keep the rest of the votes, keep the rest of the, um, sorry, of the, um, of the option credits for yes or no accordingly, and then run this algorithm. And now he has, a, he has a sample of option cuties, yes and no. And these, these option cuties, they act in a very, very similar way. So if you try and measure them, then there's a very, very hi, uh, high probability that you are going to be able to figure out exactly how they're, uh, how, how they're, how they're, um, they're formed. N well, not exactly how they're formed, but the difference between, between them. So they, they have a very, very similar behavior. So what we can prove is that this algorithm finds a difference with overwhelming probability in the number of voters. And if the protocol learns less than exponential number of times, then this attack su succeeds with probability at least 25%. So we have a good chance of, of cheating. So, and I, I, I need to, to stress that this, this type of protocols has been uh, proposed in order to, uh, con to correct for the double voting uh, problem, but it seems that it still uh, doesn't. And the last category of uh, quantum voting protocols is the ones that we call conjugate coordinates. So they're basic, basically uh, protocols that are uh, based on BB84 states. So there are two uh, uh, papers in 2008, 2013, and how they run is as follows. They, they use an election authority, and election authority creates a blank ballot for each voter. So this blank ballot uses a lot of fragments, let's say, of BB84 sets, but they all need to add up to a zero. So the bases are chosen at random, but the bits need to add up to zero. Then each voter gets one of these big blocks, these big blank ballots, re-randomizes it, does the same thing, changes the bits, but still needs to keep the bits to add up to zero. And encode a vote in the ballot, as is seen at the uh, last, last um, uh, qubit, and sends it back to, um, to T. So the encoding is just by, uh, by irritation again. Then what is happening is that the election authority announces the basis that it used for the formation of the ballot to the Talia. Now we have, we have two authorities, an election authority and a Talia. And the Talia measures and announces the, the result. So there's a few problems still with this type of protocols. First of all, an adversary can change the vote. So it can take the, um, the ballot uh, after the, um, uh, the voter has voted and can just do some random rotation at the end. So this would just destroy the vote. But if you, you have some pre-information on who the favorable candidate, for example, is, you can actually um, um, influence the vote as you like. There is some violation of, property, of privacy as well because the election authority is uh, forming this type of um, th th this uh, blank ballot, so it could introduce some serial number in the, in the ballots uh, themselves. So there is no security against the malicious uh, le election authority. And last, this scheme is based on um, a problem that is supposed to be hard to solve for quantum computers. So this problem is that given W blank ballot fragments, it's hard to produce W plus one. So given this sort of a, of a blank ballot, it's difficult to uh, take it and reproduce um, and produce an extra one. Okay, so um, am I doing with times? Okay, good. So um, as a conclusion, what I wanted to say is that there's a lot. There's a lot of proposals for quantum electronic voter schemes. These are great ideas. It's still we're starting to um, to see how to um, to apply. Um, quantum information in any voting, but there are, there are a lot of problems still. So there, are, there is a lot of space for, for research. So 
for dual basis protocols, to begin with, there is a problem with this cut and choose technique. This is not working as it's supposed to be, so it needs to be further studied. This might be done, for example, by introducing some randomness that is trusted by all the players. Um, for the traveling ballot protocols, it looks like unless we combine it with some other new techniques, it doesn't seem to provide a viable solution. Double voting seems to always be possible, and I, at least we couldn't see any straightforward way to guarantee uh, privacy. So concerning distributed ballot protocols, they, they, they seem like a very good candidate. They provide strong privacy guarantees, but still we don't have any verifiability. So verifiability is probably the last thing that we would like to have since we usually assume that our election authorities or the tallers are honest or semi-honest at least. But the efforts to stop double voting have not yet been uh, successful. And at the end, these conjugate coding protocols, except from the privacy issues that they have, uh, they're also based on a hardness assumption that should probably be further um, analyzed. Okay, so um, the whole goal of this, of this review was basically to, um, to try to convince people that there's a lot of things that need to be done. First of all, we should properly define the desired property. So what does it mean to ask for privacy, for verification? We need to, to, to um, uh, give proper definitions in appropriate security frameworks. And if possible, in composable frameworks in order to be able to, um, uh, to play with, uh, with, this, uh, with the routines uh, around. So we have managed to identify um, faulty subroutines in all the proposed protocols, so none of this is, is working as it's supposed to be. Uh, so this should be, should, should be improved. And finally, there should be a proper study of classical electronic voting pr protocols because this is um, an area that has, um, that has been uh, long studied, that there is a lot of tools that we could use, and we could probably identify subroutines, classical subroutines that we could uh, uh, replace and improve by um, uh, quantum communication. So um, that's the end of my talk. Thanks. Okay, let's thank Anna. <laughs> questions. We have time for questions. Um, regarding the, the last point on, on your last slide, uh, have you looked into quantum oblivious transfer as a building block for I, uh, I, secure I, I, multi I'm sorry, I can't, I can't hear you. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Ha have you looked into quantum oblivious transfer as a building block um, for uh, secure multi-party computation as a mean to uh, create an e-voting protocol? So, not specifically for electronic voting protocols, maybe you should check here. Yeah. yeah, so not specifically for electronic voting protocols, but we know that OT is universal for multi-party computation, right? So that would be, any, um, let's say, not a straightforward way to do it, but you can reduce it to OT. However, there's no, um, uh, there's Im it's, uh, it's impossible to do OT uh, unconditionally, right? So you would still, so what we would like, I, th I mean at least what I would like is to be able to have this type of hybrid classical and quantum protocols for e-voting that can at least um, secure that you don't get complete, uh, you don't have a, let's say 100% uh, cheating probability against a quantum adversary. You could get a, at least something better. So maybe OT is the way to do this, but it's, it might not be the, um, the only way or the perfect way. Thank you. Following on that question, uh, the uh, quantum oblivious transfer is like uh, actually one of Wiesner's original uh, multiplexing channel. Uh, you could, you could, I think there's hope in protocols which rely on the unavailability of a full-scale quantum computer and uh, using quantum manipulations that are relatively easy to do with small amount of quantum resources uh, and that would require much bigger quantum resources to break them. And uh, oblivious transfer is one of those. So you're basically proposing to uh, put some limits on the uh, the quantum resources that we have, right? Yeah, that's the that's that's the uh, yeah that that, yeah. that w that's what breaks a oblivious transfer. You can yeah, uh, but but I wonder if the, the, the most uh, intriguing area of of voting uh, uh, C 
security is the non receipt fullness i wonder if there's anything that a quantum quantum enabled but quantum limited in in the sense of not having a full scale quantum operations could do to to make that happen i'm i'm not aware of uh, of any such scheme so yeah maybe um, one quick question for me yes. uh, regarding the um, conjugate coding pro protocols what is the the assumption that you that you have so the assumption is called one more unforgeability. So what it relies on is, so these are, we call them uh, blank ballot fragments. So it's line, let's say, and it's called a blank ballot as a total. So what this uh, relies on is basically keeping a few of these, um, so voting for a different thing, like voting for some candidate that you wouldn't really want, for example, and keeping some of these Fragments. So if you if you if you if you uh, corrupt like a, a number of voters, then you can keep some of these fragments and reproduce like a bigger uh, ballot, let's say. So by having, for example, I don't know, four, you can get an, a fifth one, something like that. Okay, thank you. Ah, one more question. Uh, sorry, like for the traveling uh, ballot protocol, uh, is the state that uh, is sent to all the voters a highly entangled state or just like? purely independent QB state. Ah, you're there, okay. So can you repeat, sorry, because I couldn't. I yeah, couldn't sure. Uh, like, like for the traveling ballot protocol, uh, is the state that is sent to the uh, voters a highly entangled state or like just independent QB state? It's a highly entangled state, actually. It's a dimension D, it's a, it's, it's a uh, let me go. Here it is, yeah? Yes. So it's a highly, uh, it's a QDIT, basically. Okay, it's so a two like QDIT and tangled state. If you have N voters, then you, like, you need a, like... No, uh, no, no, this doesn't depend, state. so, so, uh, so uh, this doesn't really, I don't, f let me see. So I'm pretty sure that this N there is, a, is doesn't correspond to the N of the voters, so it should be a D or something. Uh, one more question. Is there any uh, like experimental demonstration of this uh, like this voting no. protocol, or like all of them are just very? Well? No, there hasn't been any experiment, at least from what I know. But if someone knows something different, then okay, thanks. Then. Okay, let's thank Anna again. Okay. Thanks. <laughs>